everyone, I'm Captain Logan, and this is DJ, and uh, DJ and I are here to promote my book. DJ, I wrote a novel. You did? Yeah, I sure did, and I am finally making it available as an audiobook today on Patreon. Uh, I wrote a book. It's called The Edible States of America. It's about the entire United States transforming into walking and talking junk food. That's what happens. It's true. It is, I've read it. Yeah, you I've sure read have. The whole thing. Yeah, did you like it? I liked it yeah. a lot. Would you recommend it? I would. Would you flip it. your sign green? We're promoting the book. He's gonna say that even if he hated it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this book is uh, not your standard novel. I'm calling it a novel. It's not exactly a novel. It is the written history of this alternate present, where this insane, crazy, impossible thing happens to people, exploring the society and uh, how people figure out how to get along or not get along, uh, and all of the uh, weird idiosyncrasies therein. Uh, the book is, like I said, available on Patreon uh, today. Didn't announce this, didn't tell anybody about it, just thought right now we would finally uh, get it out there for you. There will be a print version out in the not-too-distant future, and more details about that soon. I, I'm allowing folks to look at it at just the $2 tier on Patreon. So if you are not already a patron, uh, you can go there right now, patreon.com slash geekvolution. Just $2 a month will get you access to the entire audiobook, and it's uploaded as just one uh, video, just uh, just one thing, several hours, many many hours. It's, it's great. It's, so, it's gonna be cool. He, thanks for letting me work on. He let me do the cover and some of the, the illustrations and stuff. So I hope you like it. And uh, it's a great book. The cover is lovely. I it's really great. It. You'll get to look at it the entire time if you're like looking at your screen when you listen to that because that's <laughs> that's 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 all you'll see. And uh, yeah, he did a wonderful job. It's fantastic. Uh, DJ has also done the interiors. Uh, the design for the uh, print book itself. And again, uh, you'll get to see that soon as well. So I uh, hope you guys like it. I'll let me know what you think of it if you take a look. Folks have been asking me about this forever. I wrote this uh, way back now in 2017. Oh, so I, Isn't it crazy how long it's been? So I can't quick. get my mind around it. Uh, I've been wanting to write another book. I want to get this out before I do that. So uh, finally, that, that one goal. So I know it's kind of weird to put out the audiobook first, but I figure a lot of you guys will probably prefer to listen to it that way. Uh, anyway, I should also mention that the entire thing is read by me. I do some silly voices in it and stuff. Hopefully, hopefully you guys like it. I'm, I haven't heard this yet. I'm as subtle as I can be with a lot of it, but there are some places where there's some there's some kind of goofy voices and stuff. So yeah, no, it's awesome. Definitely, uh, definitely join Patreon if you're if you're interested at all, or if you just like sci-fi or uh, a little. If you like parody, it's not full on parody, but it's got a little, some elements of it's. It's pretty funny. It's got some humor in it. And, uh, well, thanks, man. Definitely. It is certainly the darkest thing I've ever It written. is dark. I recommend if you, if you just like uh, uh, Patreon because it makes Captain Logan do dark things, I definitely recommend this because this goes to some very dark it's, places. It's wild. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very rated R thing. Get your, get your kids out of the room. Yeah, don't play this in the car when you're picking up your kids. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you guys like it. Uh, thanks a bunch for taking a look at this, and uh, we'll see you again soon. I'm Captain Logan. All right. I'm, that was DJ. Thanks, thanks buddy. Me. Bye. Document 2, Oscar Myers, Ames, Iowa, the introductory entry to his personal post-foodification journal, five days after the transformation. I used to love my parents. They were wonderful growing up. They took me to Hawkeye's baseball games every summer, even though it was a two-hour road trip from Ames to Iowa City. I always wanted to move to Kansas City to watch the Royals play. I watched as much pro baseball as I could, and the Royals were my favorite. Iowa didn't have a pro team, so I had to settle for college if I wanted to go to the stadium. I dreamed of playing first base, but I never played more than a season in junior high, and after that I hardly got much of a shot. I played right field, and it's important, you know, you gotta know how to catch, you gotta know how to... Eh, you know the rest. Except in my case, the ball never miraculously wound up in my glove to make the game-shattering play, so I just stood there, bored, heavy, and self-conscious. Yeah, I loved baseball, but I loved hot dogs just a little more. I certainly devoted more of my time and passion to devouring them than I did to practicing throwing and catching and getting in good enough shape for anyone to take me seriously. I don't know if I would have been any good. They say if you put in 10,000 hours at anything, you'll be at least proficient at it, and I got a lot closer to 10,000 frank eating hours than I did catching or batting hours by a factor of a thousand mostly because I was terrified to be seen in public running or jumping or moving in any way. You only have so many viable years to even get that good and still be young enough to get noticed and make pro. 
and I squandered mine. By my junior year in high school, I knew I had no chance at being the next James Clinton, the first baseman for the Royals and my idol. The dream was dead. But my folks were amazing. Mom and Dad were both fit, both athletic. They went biking and fishing, and they ran the trails on the weekends. I can't begin to fault them for my condition, or at least I didn't used to. They raised me to eat my fruits and vegetables. They didn't keep pop in the house. We ate at home except one special day of the month because Dad was nuts for spare ribs. They encouraged an active and healthy lifestyle, and they practiced what they preached. But despite my rapid weight gain by the fifth grade, they never guilt-tripped me about it never told me I disappointed them, and they took me to all the baseball they could, I think hoping it would inspire me to make healthier choices and get on the diamond myself. You may be asking yourself, if your folks made these perfect homemade meals, how did you get your hands on so many hot dogs? Well, they could control what I ate at home, but not at school. Like so many parents, they didn't really know what was available at the cafeteria, and they never thought to ask. They just paid the school lunch fees, and that was that. And it was, of course, nothing like what I was eating at home. It was sloppy joes, and cheeseburgers, and french fries, and greasy, amorphous pizza, and mastacholi, whatever the hell that is, and hot dogs. They weren't the best, but they were more edible than a lot of the food that was available to me. Something about eating those whenever I could, and then comparing them to the real deal ballpark dogs whenever I attended a game, got me addicted. So I went out of my way to get my hands on them everywhere I went. I got the dogs at Burger King whenever my folks and I went there on road trips, but it was too far away to go on my own, and they weren't like what you got at the stadium. The closest thing was that little dog place franchised out from New York. I used to hike there after school when I was supposed to be in math club. I was walking, but I ate so many hot dogs, the precious little exercise I got hardly made a difference. If I burned the calories to make up for one, there were plenty more sitting in my belly, hoping against hope to be fully digested before the next giant bites of the wiener joined them. It got to the point where all I really wanted was some kind of meat wrapped up in a bun, be it Vienna sausage, or a bratwurst, or a San Francisco-style bacon-wrapped dog with fried peppers and onions. Considering what I started putting on these things, I really didn't have to eat too many before I started asking Mom to take me to Target for bigger jeans. There's a reason people call that last one a heart attack dog. I don't know what it was. I wasn't huge into junk food as a kid. Maybe it was a subconscious thing connected to my baseball obsession. When you're a kid and you really love something, you live it, at least in your head, 24-7. All the gamers I knew were playing Final Fantasy and Pokemon and Zelda every minute of every day, regardless of whether they had a controller or a Game Boy in their hands. They played through the doodles they made in their notebooks while the teacher was lecturing about Quantrill's raid, planning digitized raids of their own they'd launch when they got home. As soon as their mothers were satisfied, they'd finish their chores and done their homework and paid a modicum of attention to their siblings. Kids play to figure out who and what they are and who and what they want to turn into. So they live it and breathe it and, in my case, eat it. Kids don't just pretend, they emulate. I wanted to play baseball, sure, but it was as much about living in that world as it was actually playing the game. Hot dogs smelled and tasted like baseball, never mind the stereotype. I think I loved it because it was a pastime of another time, the America we'd long forgotten, a world that, through the lens of YouTube videos and history books, looked brighter and safer and fair as it gone. It didn't bother me that none of my friends cared about it and that the sports universe didn't worship baseball stars the way it did the breakouts in football and basketball. It was my sport, and I wanted to suck up everything it had to offer. If I could have gotten my hands on some, I'd have probably chewed tobacco. Or maybe it was fate, and my name was prophetic. But we'll get to that. Almost two decades later, as I was driving my taxi cab in the early afternoon, the dreaded transformation happened, and I was suddenly, quite literally, wearing my obsession on my sleeve. And all over me. In that moment, as the man-sized hamburger next to me was spewing and stuttering, saying, I'd like a, a, a quarter, quarter pounder with ch ch cheese and a large fry, and give me a Dr. Pepper, that'll be six twenty nine. pull to the first window, please. I pulled the cab onto the curb, stared at my reflection in the rearview mirror, and only one thought went through my mind. Damn you, Greg and Irene Myers, you just had to go and name your son Oscar. What were you thinking? My name is Oscar Myers, and I'm a hot dog. Used to eat nothing but hot dogs, now I am one. 
What are the odds of that? Not only is it the reason I wound up weighing 250 pounds at 5 feet 8 inches, but I'd been made fun of up and down for as long as I can remember for having the name of the most popular hot dog manufacturer on my birth certificate. Looking back, I don't know how I didn't avoid the things just because of how much ammunition I was loading up for any bully who knew my name if he saw me at a restaurant inhaling one. But names are important. They have a lot to do with how we perceive ourselves, even if and especially when we aren't paying them any mind. At the risk of psychoanalyzing myself, I wonder if the baseball thing wasn't an association I made at an early age between my name and that sport. Maybe all the ridicule and teasing I suffered when I was six and seven led me to baseball as a coping mechanism, and by extension, the extreme hot dog addiction. Maybe deep down I decided to own the name and become an Oscar Mayer, so I wouldn't care so much when the kids relentlessly berated me. My name isn't even spelled the same way, but the enormous, imposing, fat kid on the bus, who I like to imagine got that way because he also ate too many hot dogs, couldn't care less. Pro tip, kids. Logic is gas on a campfire for bullies. The best way in my situation to end up with a wedgie or my head in a toilet or folded up in a locker was to say, no, sideburns, you don't understand. Myers isn't even spelled like Meyer. I am speaking from experience, but I won't say which of those things happened to me. I have a new theory, and this is why I no longer like my parents. They did this to me. Oh, not intentionally. I know mom and dad care about me deeply, and the fact that they are now respectively a walking, talking, human-sized pixie stick and a chicken pot pie will never change that. But what parent in his or her right mind would name a child Oscar Myers? It's like naming your kid Jim Beam or Walt Disney or General Mills. Hell, I'd take Michael over Oscar. My folks swear it didn't even occur to them until after I was born that mom fell in love with the name Oscar after she saw Ghostbusters 2 and she insisted on it if she had a boy. Which would have been a questionable thing to name your kid after anyway. Why would you want that horrible image of the terrified baby and the slime faucet every time you gave him a bath? I really wish, especially now that I am what I ate, I had been born a girl. Maybe if I'd been Olivia Myers or Rachel Myers, I'd be a roast beef sandwich or a chimichanga or a root beer float now. Not that any of those sound any more appealing than any other kind of junk food I can think of turning into or that I've seen other people cope with. I feel bad for cookies. Not only can all kinds of things make you come apart, like a sudden rain shower or, depending on the cookie, just tripping over your stupid new skinny cartoon legs and falling on the asphalt, but you're constantly in danger of some asshole yelling, well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I'm going to eat my words after I say this, but I still can't think of anything more humiliating than being a human hot dog named Oscar Myers. And no, I don't even want to know what I'm made of now. Whoever or whatever unleashed the food apocalypse or sugar rapture or whatever moniker we finally settle on clearly has a twisted sense of humor. There's no way that's a coincidence, any more than this 90s Cartoon Network-esque hell we're all living in is. I'm not going to offer any wild conspiracy theories about what caused it, like every TV channel and website has been doing since April 26th, but there's no way it wasn't intentional, premeditated, and supernatural. Ronald McDonald didn't make me believe in magic as a kid. But this madness sure has. I love all the physicists and biologists coming out of the woodwork saying, there must be a scientific explanation for all this. Oh yeah? I'm a 5 foot 8 inch talking hot dog with my old eyes and mouth but nothing else that's mine. I've got white stringy arms and legs like those bendable action figures of the California raisins I had as a kid. And I've got four fingered gloved hands like Mickey Mouse. And let me stress this part. I'm a hot dog that just happens to be named after a hot dog company. Some psychopath got his hands on some Harry Potter-level wizardry and turned the United States into an edible toontown, or my name isn't... Yeah, I'm not saying it again. It's really, really hard not to blame myself. I know there's no way anything I've done, even eating six trillion hot dogs in 20 years could possibly have turned me into this mutated fast food freak, any more than the other 320 million people in America did it to themselves. Or at least I didn't do it on my own. I wonder if my life choices had a hand in deciding what food I turned into, and that makes me wish I'd been more careful about what I put into my body. But then what good would that have done? 
Nobody turned into an apple or an asparagus. And there is a growing segment of the population that's staying entirely away from the sugary, fatty, high cholesterol, processed crap the vast majority of us are addicted to. And they're all donuts and Pop-Tarts and breakfast burritos, too. But it's hard to think rationally when the impossible has happened to you and everyone else in a 4,000 square mile radius. Whenever I look in the mirror now, which is even less often than before, when it was hard to cope with my coney-induced mastodon stature, I feel a massive pain of if only I'd been more like mom and dad. Yeah, they were dumb enough to name their kid after the first and last name your baloney has, but they tried harder than anyone I've known to set a good example for their offspring and live as clean and well as they could. I don't honestly hate my folks because of the prophetic name that's come to define me, both mentally and physically. I hate them because I want so desperately to be them, even the pixie stick and pot pie versions they are now. Because no matter what they look like, they're not going to stop trying to be the best versions of themselves. And I honestly can't say if I can do that or not. I certainly didn't exercise that willpower when I was human. What chance do I have when my favorite food is my reflection? That constant reminder of my utter lack of self-control. What chance do I have when everyone around me is behaving like it's the end of the world as we know it? If you're outside the quarantine, if you're still human, you might be wondering how anyone who is a hot dog could still have an appetite for hot dogs. With respect, and I'm sure you know at least one person in a letter or an email or on Skype that's already said this to you, but you can't imagine what it's really like until it's happened to you. A poll just came out today that said 70% of people initially thought they were dreaming the transformation, that it was all just a bizarre nightmare. The thought certainly crossed my mind when it happened. Turning into the junk food you anxiety binge is up there with going to the office without any pants on or taking a trigonometry test you didn't study for. We're all still trying to process this, trying to understand the larger implications, trying to figure out how we're going to go on with our lives. And I can tell you that while I might lose interest in eating anything that might bring my dinner or deliver my mail, right now, there are only a couple of things that bring me any real comfort. One is that even though I'm a hot dog, I'm suddenly ultra thin and I weigh less than I did in fourth grade before I got fat. But the second thing is still baseball. And when I think about baseball, I want a hot dog. I don't know if I can get fat again as a hot dog. I don't know if I can gain weight. I haven't eaten one since my metamorphosis, mostly because there's still so much pandemonium out there, looting and rioting and picketing. And so it's too dangerous to even leave the house. But I'm not ready to promise that you'll never see Oscar Myers, the living hot dog, wolf down another hot dog. I have this irrational feeling that I brought this on myself. And sometimes I have to fight the ridiculous idea that I brought it on all of us. But honestly, if I had a heart attack dog sitting right here, even if I knew I could get just as big as I was before, I don't know if that would be enough to stop me from eating it.